Hi guys, Dr. Dillard here. This is part two of Thursday. It is GIGU. It's Thursday's lecture. Couldn't quite finish it. We left off. Uh, it's the fall of 2020. Um, we left off on esophageal carcinoma, so we can finish this up. Lots of pictures here, so we... It's a lot of slides, but it, there's not really that many slides. Esophageal carcinoma... Um, this is no joke. This is a very dangerous cancer. Even with good treatment, Stanford, UCSF, any of the big hospitals, the five-year survival rate is only 17%. So 2005, it killed more than 400 people. I need to get that updated, but I haven't had time. It's the eighth most common cause of death worldwide. 1,600 new cases are diagnosed each year. Um, most common uh, is the most common upper gastrointestinal tumor in certain parts of the world, especially parts of the world that smoke heavily. Signs and symptoms of cancer of the esophagus go, typically goes through this pattern. So the person has trouble swallowing uh, large food like steak and things like that. So they go to a softer type of food and they do pretty good uh, for six months or so. And then they have, they start having trouble even with that. Uh, and then they just go to soup. And even they have trouble with that eventually as the cancer gets worse. Um, so that's the typical progression of this. And then they get weight loss, of course. If you can't eat, you get weight loss. Um, it may, just like Barrett's esophagus, a chunk of people didn't have any pain at all. And that's the same thing here. In fact, about 45% of patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, have no GERD symptoms or, or had no GERD symptoms or very infrequent GERD symptoms. Um, so that's not, not good. There's no warning sign, right? If you know you have GERD, at least you can keep an eye on things. Uh, in late-stage disease, this one typically gets the right supraclavicular node, so you can get lymphadenopathy in that node. It can be in the left as well. It could be in both. Uh, there is, of course, a left Virchow's node um, on, in someone with with esophageal cancer. Making the diagnosis, you have to go down and biopsy the tissue and see what the pathologist has to say. If you find mutated esophageal mucose cells, that have gotten loose from the basement membrane and started penetrating down, um, you got yourself cancer. CT scan will be the next step to figure out where the cancer has spread. And in fact, just a second to talk about PET scans. Those are the even better than CT scans, so it's always good to go to a big institution that has a PET scanner, and they put a radioactive tracer in uh, that is designed to find cancer and stick to it, cancer cells, and then they'll they'll be able to, after they give you that injection, they do this, almost a CT-like scan, and it shows up where it sticks. Uh, it is very expensive. Also, if they find a cancer, the next step is to do a lymph node biopsy uh, of the big the sentinel nodes in the area, whether it be the celiac nodes. Uh, supraclavicular nodes uh, to see how, how bad it's gotten loose. For example, here's a 55-year-old smoker, long history of GERD. Six months ago, they began having dysphagia, trouble speaking. Uh, his, the endoscopic evaluation was done and cancer was diagnosed. Then the next step is to have a PET scan to see if it's spread. And not only can you see the big tumor here, but you can see it spread up into here up into his throat uh, and down into this region. So not a good prognosis. There's two types of cancer in of the esophagus. The most common in developed nations is adenocarcinoma, uh, about 50%, greater than 50% of the cases. This one's on the rise for some reason. This is the one that's associated with the Barrett's esophagus. Uh, and then the one that's more common in third world countries is squamous cell carcinoma. And that one's the one uh, that's associated with smoking and overuse of alcohol. That's all I'll say. I cut the rest of those slides out. I think that's good enough for cancer. 
Uh, Mallory Weiss tear. It's another one we need to know. I don't think you know this one. It's basically a rip. You've ripped your esophagus. That's right. You can rip your esophagus, the wall of the esophagus. And it's typically from people who vomit a lot. Bulimics, alcoholics are the two big uh, groups here. Uh, the tear may extend down into the abdominal esophagus, so possibly you could get a peritonitis from this condition. Um, so not good. Um, sometimes it bleeds a lot, sometimes it doesn't bleed a lot, but the blood in the stomach, the stomach hates blood, and it makes you nauseated and you'll vomit that blood. And let's see, typically caused by multiple episodes of vomiting, or retching. What's retching? Retching is the dry heaves. You vomit, but nothing comes up. It's the worst in the world, right? Um, hematemesis. Uh, we'll look at these definitions in a minute, but that's the vomiting up of any type of blood. You can have coffee ground blood or bright red blood, but hematemesis is a general word for throwing up blood. Um, or you can have blood coming out your stool, and the stool will be dark looking because the blood is degraded. And that's called melena, a melanic stool. Melanic stool. Um, again, alcoholics and bulimics are common with this condition. Um, we should mention upper versus lower GI bleeds. Where's the demarcation for upper and lower? Well, we already talked about upper and lower respiratory tract, right? The glottis is the demarcation zone. Um, this one you know uh, as well. It's the ligament of trites, uh, which attaches to the duodenal jejunal flexure. Remember that from gross two days? Uh, and that hooks into our friend the right crust. Do we have a picture of that? I think I do. There we go. So there's the duodenum, there's the descending, there's the transverse or part three, the ascending. It's kind of coming out of the plane of the page at us. And right where it curves right here, that's the duodenal jejunal flexure. And there's an important ligament that stabilizes the duodenum, um, and that's called the ligament of trites, and it connects into the celiac trunk. It's got some fibers there, but most of the fibers blend in with the uh, the right crust, which we've talked a lot about, right? That's the one that beefs up the, kind of supports the esophagus there. All right, so that's the demarcation zone. Um, so if you get a polyp here and it bleeds like crazy, you have yourself an upper GI bleed. If it bleeds down here in the jejunum, here's a polyp again, it's bleeding, or this is a diverticulum, sorry. Uh, these are bleeding. That's a lower GI bleed. So in a colon would be any source of bleeding in the colon. Lower GI bleed. Stomach in the esophagus is an upper GI bleed. Uh, fresh blood degradation. Uh, so the longer that blood sits in your stomach or in your intestines, the more broken down it gets. Specifically, the hemoglobin is broken down into hematin. Uh, hematin, which by the way, if it gets ingested by macrophages or other uh, any other of the troops, one of the byproducts from that digestion is hemosiderin. Hemosiderin is just a protein and an iron, uh, but it doesn't go that far. Uh, but if you just get flat out hemoglobin broken down into hematin, uh, that's enough to color the blood a dark, really dark coal like color or a tar like color. Okay. And let's see. Fresh blood, of course, that comes out that hasn't been broken down will always be red in color because of the heme. Uh, the hemoglobin is still intact. So hemoptysis is coughing up a pink frothy sputum. Okay, why is it frothy? Because it's got air and CO2 mixed in with it. That's typically not a stomach problem. We're talking about blood coming out of the mouth. I might as well throw this one in here now. That means that typically the bleed is coming from the alveoli, secondary to pulmonary hypertension. From could be another anything. Left heart failure is probably the most common. Mitral valve stenosis. Hematemesis, again, means uh, that you are throwing up blood. It could be of any color. Um, it's usually red, 
which means the stomach uh, didn't tolerate the blood very long. It also usually means an aggressive bleed because it hasn't been digested. If it's a little trickle of blood, like with an esophageal tear, uh, maybe. Well, I mean, esophageal tears can kill you, too. You can bleed out from it. But it just, if there's a little leak, uh, the stomach will whip it up into coffee ground, like substance, and you vomit it. That's called coffee ground uh, emetus or vomitus, if you will. Right? There's some hematochesia that was quite red from a large upper GI bleed. The coffee ground vomitus, I guess I got that in there twice, don't I? Resembles coffee grounds. So coffee ground vomitus or emetus, that means throwing up coffee grounds. Let's take a look at them. That's what they look like. That's co coffee ground vomitus in a patient with... Um, I believe this was a gastric ulcer patient. Hematochesia, isn't that like the third time? Hematochesia, the pas passage of fresh blood. Oh, sorry, hematochesia. Um, chesia. So now we're at the other end. That's the passage of fresh uh, red blood through the anus. Uh, it could be mixed in with the stool. It doesn't have to be mixed in with the stool. But it, it's usually mixed in with the stool because we have another word for when it comes out without the stool. Uh, it indicates a lower GI bleed, but usually way low, like in the colon, uh, in the descending colon or transverse colon. Typically from a bleeding diverticulum, a colonic diverticulosis is common for causing hematochesia. Oh, there could be a hemorrhoid uh, way, way down in the rectum. Inflammatory bowel disease we'll talk about, especially alterative colitis likes to bleed. Um, and maybe it's a lacerated or ripped uh, anal canal. You had a big uh, bowel movement. You're really you're constipated, and it grew and grew in size, and you finally passed it, but it actually ripped the tissue. So that could cause a bleed as well. In fact, that's pretty common. Uh, 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 rectoragia is a bright passage of bright red blood, but there's no stool. It's just kind of draining out your uh, your anus. Hemorrhoids can do that one for sure. Hematochesia. Melania, we already said that's uh, that's caught. That's like a tarry stool, and that means it's usually an upper jo It it could be from an upper GI bleed that's had a long time to digest, or maybe a lower GI bleed that's just not bleeding that much. It all depends on how broken down the substance gets. But the hemoglobin is transformed into hematin. And there is a melanic stool right there from an upper GI bleed. Okay, the cult blood. Um, that is invisible blood. You don't, you don't see it at all. When you wipe, when you look in the toilet, you can't see it. It's invisible. Everybody should have an occult blood test because colon cancer can start leaking blood like this that you can't see. And so there's a kit that you can get and you can uh, send it in. Your primary doc, you can order that yourself on your patients if you wanted to go. I mean, that's usually primary doc's range or kind of scope, but you could do that if you wanted to. And it's great for ske uh, screening out colon cancer. Trouble is, if you have hemorrhoids, which are super common, it'll pick up occult blood from that. So the sensitivity or specificity of it isn't the for greatest. Uh, but at least it'll if you have blood, it'll you'll have to further check that out. Uh, what are some risk factors? Now, back to the Mallory Rice tear from vomitors, usually. What are some risk factors? Alcohol overconsumption. Um, alcohol is caustic, right? Alcohol is pretty, pretty wicked. In, f in fact, there's a new treatment for contained disc herniations where they're acti actually injecting ethanol into the center of the disc, kind of like the old papaya enzyme that, they, that was banned kind of the same theme. It's very destructive. That's the number one risk factor. And plus, it makes you gir regurgitate, especially if you have an alcohol problem and you're over-drinking and vomiting a lot. Uh, bulimia is definitely a problem, as we said. Uh, people on anticoagulation medication are at risk for this. They're at risk for bleeds just in general because their blood is, is thin and doesn't clot well. People with hiatal hernia are also at risk. It's really easy for acid to get up. Uh, and start wrecking the stomach this way. You can rip a hole in your stomach from this. Or it can cause frequent regurgitation. 
because this is not really a hole. This is not like a perforation because of GERD. This is a violent action uh, that has ripped the esophagus. Idiopathic could be idiopathic as well. Peritonitis, yeah, it's paw, sure. If you get a perforation into abdominal aorta, yeah, you can definitely, all your food and bacteria and such will get into the peritoneal cavity and you're off to the races with regard to peritonitis. Here's a little copy or a little cartoon of this and you can see the tears in the esophagus here and they'd be leaking blood, of course, down into the stomach. There's a much bigger tear that's actually healed from the, I think this is like after a week in the hospital. Um, it's tears healing up pretty nicely. 10% of all people with hematoschesia or hematemesis end up having a Mallory Weiss tear. Mortality right? Yeah, this is my mortality. People can bleed out from this, going to hypovolemic shock. It's about 3%. Um, so this is, you know, not like a super rare disease. It can kill people. Uh, esophageal varicosities, our last subject of the day. Pretty simple. They're just varicose veins of the esophagus, though. So you get varicose veins. They could be inside the lumen of the esophagus, which is where they usually are, but they could be outside as well. And... Um, yeah, clinically important. The distal esophagus is where they typically occur. They are highly associated with liver disease. Uh, about 50% of develop people with liver disease, about 50% develop uh, varicosities uh, because of portal hypertension. And that's what they're caused by, right? The only thing that could cause these varicosities has got to be a beaver dam somewhere. And that's exactly what happens. What's the sequelae of these? Well, if they bleed, it's a medical emergency uh, because you can go in shock. Again, 20% mortality, or no, I didn't tell you this. On average, even with treatment, there's about a 20% mortality rate uh, for pe for the first bleeding event secondary to esophageal varicosities. Um, even higher if you're also on a Xarelto or other anticoagulation medication, higher mortality rate. Uh, so about like PEs, and but worse if you're on blood thinners. There's a normal esophagus. We haven't looked at one of those for a while. Okay, nice and pink looking. Oh, I can hear people saying, oh, God, that's gross looking. Yep, so those are large esophageal varicosities from a patient with cirrhosis of the liver. Um, the, here's one that they tried to tie it off. The same, this is the same way they treat hemorrhoids. If they can get a rubber band around it, uh, it'll it'll die. This part will die down here and scar shut. That's one of the best ways to treat these things. What causes them? Number one cause by far, increased portal hypertension secondary to cirrhosis of the liver. Remember, cirrhosis of the liver is kind of a parent category. Uh, there's many causes of cirrhosis, like alcoholism, uh, virus, viral infections, especially hepatitis B and C. You can have an autoimmune attack of the liver. These all uh, can cause esophageal varicosities because they all cause a beaver dam. It makes it tough to push portal blood and cavil blood through the liver and so it backs up. Portal hypertension is uh, found in 90% of patients with cirrhosis, just FYI. So there's a beaver dam sitting in the liver so we're trying to push blood <coughs> excuse me, through the liver. Can't do it because the beaver dam's locked it up. There's a vein called the portal. Um, uh, well, there's two. We know these, right, from gross two. We know the portal vein, and we know the splenic vein, and we know the superior mesenteric vein and the inferior mesenteric vein. But up a little bit higher, there is a left gastric vein, and off the gastric vein comes the portal esophageal vein. And that's the one that runs down the uh, lower esophagus. And that actually anastomoses into the cavil system, but I don't think we need to worry about that any more than that. How about other causes of portal hypertension? Is it always just cirrhosis of the liver? No, there's other things that can wreck the inside of the liver. Schistosomiasis, in fact, is the number one 
cause in developing nations. That's a bug that gets in there, causes a riparian infection, and uh, that can cause a beaver dam. Uh, and liver cancer, primary tumor in the liver, just the size of the tumor. Well, that's nice that you decide to pop up every once in a blue moon. Um, so a primary tumor of the cancer can cause a beaver dam. Uh, metastatic disease, I could have added that in there as well. You could get metastatic disease uh, that will eventually cause a beaver dam. But embolic disease, uh, what if you get a big uh, blood clot in the portal system? And that gets stuck as a beaver dam going into the liver, right? It's not going to pass through the liver if it goes through the portal system. So you could have an embolism get stuck in there. What's the pathophysiology? That's pretty straightforward. It's a beaver dam. And that backs up uh, the blood trying to get into the liver. And it goes backwards and it goes into the, uh, the esophageal veins. And then the pressure rises and rises in those tiny microcirculation and it just starts bleeding because it's not designed to handle that type of pressure. What are the signs of esophageal varicosities? Bleeding, hemato hemat hematemesis, so you could have coffee ground vomitus or frank red blood vomiting up and you might be spilling some from the stomach into the intestines and it may come out as melanic stools or melina. Uh, acute hemorrhage of one of these veins is a the most common cause of death in patients with portal hypertension. It's usually not the 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 cirrhosis that kills them. It's bleed from uh, that's the most common cause is a bleed uh, from esophageal varicosities caused by the cirrhosis of the liver. All right, I think we're just about done. There's another treatment uh, where they use the rubber band treatment. And all right, so we made it through week three. See you all later.